We're excited to have you here. As we go into this uh, evening worship service, <clears throat> Brother Nathan is still under the weather, and Brother Bruce White will be leading our singing. Brother Johnny Parker has our opening prayer. Brother Jordan Coates, our uh, scripture reading. Brother Greg is going to start a uh, study in Job tonight. You know, the, one of the books that lads to leaders are studying in Bible Bowl is Job. And the eldership thought it would be good if, in addition to understanding individual things in verses, we got a better understanding of the overall book. And we had, that's why we had asked Brother Greg to let this be one of the things that he preached on before we get into Lads to Leaders Convention. Would you join with uh, Brother Bruce as he leads us in singing? Uh, after Brother Greg's lesson, uh, Brother Tommy Barragona will have announcements and Brother Corey Rogers will have our dismissal prayer. We'll begin our song service this evening with Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. <clears throat> Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord.
Bow with me, please. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come here tonight to study a portion of your word. We'll supply the lessons from Job that Greg will present to us to our hearts to help us become better Christians and better examples out in the community. Lord, be with all the sick and those who have recently lost loved ones and comfort them. Let us always look for opportunities to bring others unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The invitation song, if you'd like to mark in your book, would be number 947. Number 947. Ask if you would please stand as we sing, I Love My Savior Too, number 610. <clears throat> Jesus, my heavenly King, but to be I know. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would stand and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate so much your attendance and participation in our worship service. Tonight, as we study Job, I want to do something a little bit differently. Uh, I would like to uh, tell you the story of Job from a first-person standpoint, so I need you to use your imagination tonight and imagine that it is actually uh, the man Job standing before you, and I want to tell you that story from that perspective. If Job were here tonight, I believe he would say something like this. As I begin to look back over my life, I realize a lot of things. You could say that when you looked at my life, that I had a wonderful life with lots of possessions. You see, I had a very large farm. I had 7,000 sheep, I had 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys. I had a lot of possessions. I had a, a great big house, and I had lots of servants. I've always been what you would call a God-fearing man, a man that trusted God, a man that had faith in God, a man that put God first. I was a man that worked hard. Because of that, I had a lot of things. But of all the things that I had, I valued the most my family, my wife, and my children. I had a loving wife, ten wonderful children, seven sons, 
three daughters. My family and I, well, we got together often. We enjoyed having meals together. We enjoyed sharing in fellowship together. We enjoyed being together. I cared for them, loved them dearly, and even offered sacrifices on my behalf. But as good as my life was, after a series of tragedies, I basically lost everything. My life was completely turned upside down. You see, things went downhill in a hurry. Things got out of control quickly. First of all, my enemies came and attacked and took my donkeys and my oxen. They killed all my servants that were there with the animals. Then fire came and, and, and burned up my sheep and more servants. More enemies came and they took my camels and killed those servants. Then worst of all, a wind came and destroyed the house where all my children were. My children were killed. Thousands of sheep and camel, hundreds of oxen and donkeys. Animal, every animal was gone. My servants were killed. Seven sons, three daughters. None survived. All died. One after the other, reports came telling me of wind and fire and raiders, thieves, everything I had. It was just my wife and I left alone. You know, it was tough to take. I accepted it, but I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on, but I understood that God gives and God takes away, that I had to put my trust and my faithfulness in God. So I continued to worship God, and I put my faith and my confidence in God. I didn't always understand what was going on, but I trusted God. Well, then, if things could get worse, they did. You see, then it went from bad to worse. In addition to losing my animals and my servants, my children, next, my entire body broke out in three, in these big, horrible bowls. I had these, these gruesome-looking, terrible sores all over my body. Because of that, I became an outcast. I had to live away from everybody else. So bad that I got a posture, a broken piece of pottery, and would, would scrape the boils on my skin because they hurt so much. I was a terrible sight. I was in great pain. I was miserable. I looked miserable. I felt miserable. Well, as you can imagine, my wife was quite angry as well. She didn't understand what was happening either. She didn't understand why those animals were killed why those servants were killed. She didn't understand why the children were killed, and she certainly didn't understand why her husband now had this terrible sickness. She tells me I should just curse God and die. Just be done with it. God's not taking care of you. God's not blessing you. Just curse him. He'll kill you. You'll be out of your pain. You'll be out of your misery. It's all over. But I told her that that wasn't something that I could do. You see, I trusted in God, and I believed in God enough to know that I needed to trust Him and worship Him in the good times and in the bad. After all, He's the one that gave me all these things, and now they're gone. I told her I, I had to put my confidence and my trust in Him. Word quickly spread of the terrible shape that I was in, and I had some friends to come and visit me. Now, they were... Well, you could say they were both sympathetic and supportive, at least at first, but you know, ultimately, they blamed me for everything. They came, and at first, it was, it was really good. They, they had good intentions. They were trying to help. And I appreciate the fact that for the first seven days, they didn't say a word, but they sat there with me. They were there present with me. They were there showing that they cared. But after seven days, they began talking. And I'll be honest, I wish they'd kept their mouth shut. Because when they started talking, they were blaming everything on me. They said it was my fault that all of this had happened. That I was being punished by God for some sin that I was unwilling to acknowledge. They said, I must not be following God. I must not be a true follower, a true believer. But you see, I knew I was. I knew in my heart that I was doing what God asked me to do. The more they talked the worse it got, and I began complaining big time. I complained to them. I complained to God. Matter of fact, I wished I'd never been born. I thought that God only blessed the upright, 
and let bad things happen only to the wicked. If that were the case, then why was I suffering the way I was suffering? Well, my friends reacted in various ways. Eliphaz was the name of my oldest friend, and, and he was the one that spoke first. And I thought him being the older of the group, he would probably have some answers. Perhaps he could help me understand why I was suffering the way that I suffered. But he asked me, are you not trusting God enough? What is it going on in your life that is causing him to punish you in this way? He said, I should remember the people from the past. In the examples that we had where the innocent are not punished, it's only the wicked that are punished. So I must be wicked as well. He said, you've got to be guilty. When people hear God or fear God and maintain their integrity, they're not punished. They're blessed. According to him, according to him, I should be happy. According to him, I should be happy that God was disciplined me and that I should just repent. That I should be thankful that God was doing what he was doing. I should acknowledge my wickedness and come clean to God. Of course, this made me even more angry. He just assumed that I was guilty. Don't you think that I had already confessed all of my sins? As soon as all of this started happening, I began thinking back about the things that I, that I could have done or should have done. Why was it that all of these bad things was happening, but I couldn't find anything that I had done wrong that I had not brought before God and asked His forgiveness? Eliphaz wasn't a lot of help. Matter of fact, in a lot of ways, he made it worse. He couldn't understand that I knew that I was living a righteous life and I was confident in it. Well, then Bildad started speaking. And if I thought Eliphaz was bad, Bildad was worse. He said some of the same things, but he was even less compassionate. He seemed to not really care at all. He said that I should think about the wisdom of the fathers and what they had said about things like this. He appealed to the past and says, again, that I'm suffering because of my guilt. That God only punishes those who betray Him. God only punishes those who forget Him. He says, I was being unreasonable and I needed to, to realize the danger of my wickedness. This made me loathe my life even more. And there were times I wanted God just to leave me alone. I felt like God had forsaken me. But again, deep down, I knew I had to trust God. Well, then Zophar comes on the scene, and, and Zophar is, is even harsher with the things he has to say. Matter of fact, he said, you know what, Job, you probably deserve to suffer even more. He said I was arrogant. He said that, that I was a know-it-all and, and, and that everyone should know what he knows. He says he wishes God could answer my questions, but since God couldn't answer my questions, Zophar thought he could answer them. He thought he knew it all. Again, he said, Job, you just need to repent. Now, who are these three to judge me? I told them that I was confident in my life, that they were no help. After we had gone back and forth several times, not really getting anywhere, a fourth fellow named Elihu shows up. He basically said the same thing in different ways. He said, I was guilty. It was all my fault. He said that I should focus on God and how he communicated his will to mankind. He said, I should think about who God is and, and that these things should cause me to reverence him and honor him, not question him. He, he didn't like the fact that I was asking these questions to God and, and he wanted me to understand that, that God was one to be revered and honored. He said God was punishing me to teach me. That God was all-knowing. That God was all-powerful. That I shouldn't question God. All through this time, I was struggling. Struggling to figure out why. Why were these terrible things happening to me? Why were, why were things happening that should not be happening? And so I, I cried out to God, seeking answers, wanting Him to answer me. Why, God, this doesn't make sense. 
I've been forsaken by everyone. All of my family is gone except for my wife, and she doesn't want to have anything to do with me. She wants me to curse you and die. My friends don't understand me, and they think I'm guilty. But I told God, you know, after all, I'm, I'm a good guy. God, God was even the one that said there was no one like me on earth, that I feared God and turned away from evil. That was his description of me. I couldn't figure out why I was suffering so much. I even questioned why I was born and why I didn't die at birth. I had done everything God had asked me to do. I was faithful to God. I was faithful to my family. I was faithful to my wife, to my friends. I helped those in need. But I was suffering in a great way. And I cried out again and again, trying to understand why. Why, God, am I suffering this way? Why am I enduring what I'm having to endure? What is it that I have done wrong? Why do I deserve what you have inflicted upon me? God finally answered. But he didn't answer me in the way that I wanted. He didn't answer me in the way that I thought he would answer. He answered me and reminded me that he was God and I was not. Looking back, he really put me in my place. He reminded me of who I was in the grand scheme of things. And as great as I thought I was, I was nothing compared to God. He reminded me that no one is perfect. He reminded me that no one can understand God in his ways. That he has something to say to us, but we don't always understand everything he says. And he asked me, he asked me as a mere creation of God, what gave me the right to question the God who created everything? He reminded me that he was the one in control. And that sometimes God allows the wicked to get rich and to live without much suffering. And sometimes he allows the innocent, the righteous, to suffer. This caused me to think about all the different reasons why I was suffering. God reminded me of how powerful he was. He reminded me of all he created all he controlled. He reminded me that he takes care of all things that are his. And so on, on the one hand, God put me in my place, helped me to realize that he is much bigger than I am and can ever hope to be. That he is the God that controls all. He is the all-powerful. He is the almighty. But he also gave me a sense of assurance that he was still God and that he would take care of me. When I got to thinking about all that God had said, and when I realized the magnificent being that he was, it caused me to confess my sinfulness and my inability to understand God's ways. It helped me to realize that while I may think that I live a great life and a righteous life, that compared to God, I'm nothing. It helped me to understand that I can't understand certain things about God, that he is just too powerful and too mighty. It helped me to understand that we can suffer because of our sins, that God sometimes allows consequences in our lives to teach us a lesson. But it also helped me to realize that sometimes we suffer because other people have sinned, that there's sin in the world. Bad things happen. And these things God allows to happen in our lives to test us, to help us. And not only does this help us learn about our relationship with God and how much we need to trust in God and depend on Him to work things out, but it's also a way for the world to see how God helps us. It helps us in our relationship with God because it helps us rely on Him, but it also helps the world to see God helping those who follow him. When we see the, the things that God has done, the impact that he has on people's lives, we see how great he is. 
finally realized that in comparison to God, I'm nothing. I still don't understand everything about God. Even after all of this back and forth with my friends, even after crying out to God for so long, and even after the answers that he gave me, I, I still don't understand everything. But God reminded me that he was in control, that I didn't have to understand everything. He was going to take care of me, that he's bigger and greater than I can ever be. And I'm, I'm glad to, to, to say tonight that I came through in the end, that I maintained my faithfulness to God, that I continued to trust him and continued to worship him. And because of that, my wealth and prosperity were restored to me. I had to apologize to God for, for throwing my fit of anger and not totally trusting him to work it out. But in the end, I realized that I did trust God and that he would work it out. My story has a, has a happy ending. God healed my body, made me clean as new. Whatever I had before, when it came to my animals, God gave me twice as much. He even gave me more children. My wife and I had seven more sons, three more daughters. And God gave me a, a long and a full life with many blessings. Looking back now, it was just a bump in the road. But it was a pretty big bump at the time. Now I can look back and see how God's will was working in my life. That he wanted me to be faithful and trust him to work things out. And he did. So tonight I want you to think about some lessons that you can learn from my life. It's easy now to look back and see some of the things that came out of that. When you go through rough patches in life, you can look back and see the lessons that you've learned. And one of the things that I learned is to see that God is still God. To see that God is still God, whatever happens in life. Whatever happened to me happened because God allowed it to happen or either did not stand in the way of it happening. And whatever we face in this lifetime, whatever may come our way, God is still on his throne. God is still in control. And we may not understand the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs, the valleys and the mountains, but God is still there for us. He still loves us. He still wants us to praise him and worship him. I also learned that that it helps us have a deeper relationship with God. You know, I thought I had a deep relationship with God before all of this happened, but after it all happened, my relationship is so much better. You see, when, when tragedies occur in life, when, when things happen in our lives, people are either driven toward God or away from God. My wife was one that said, get away from God. My friend said some similar things. But I was driven toward God, and I, and I asked him questions, and I expressed my hurts my anger, my frustrations to God. And that was fine. God was able to handle it. And ultimately, I left with a sense of God's power and awesomeness. I was drawn closer to God as a result of going through my horrible experience. Then third, I learned that it helps to praise God and never take our blessings for granted. I had to think back about who gave me my wealth my sheep, my animals, my children, my health. It was God that gave me all those things. And what a blessing it was to have that wife and those ten precious children. What a blessing it was to, to live in close proximity to my children. What a blessing it was to have a family that enjoyed spending time together. What a blessing it was to be able to approach God freely on behalf of my family. You see, I, I, was, a, I was a blessed man. God had opened up the windows of heaven and, and poured out his blessings on me. I was reminded to count our blessings daily, to thank him for what he's done for us, because what we have today may be gone tomorrow. So we really need to express our gratitude to God. I had to remember... The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. But the name of the Lord is still blessed. 
And finally, I guess the greatest lesson I learned in all of this is the need to persevere and remain faithful. You see, whatever happens, whatever happens, good or bad, we've got to remain faithful. I have to admit, it was a whole lot easier being faithful to God in those good times. When my family was enjoying being together, when I had all of those animals and, and all of those servants and everything was as good as it could be, that was pretty easy. It was tougher when all of those things were taken away from me. When I felt like I had been knocked down and was at the bottom of the barrel. But I learned to persevere. I learned to remain faithful because God is faithful and God will take care of us. We've got to persevere through the bad times. There are some things that we just don't understand and may not ever understand. But God is bigger than we are. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. We just have to persevere. We have to be faithful. So if you were to summarize my story, it would go something like this. I really did nothing to deserve what I got, but I got it anyway. Bad things sometimes happen. But God is still God, and compared to God, I'm nothing. I had to realize that it was all right to question God, although I might not get the answers I'm wanting. He reminded me who really is God. So I hope tonight that you learn from this story about the faithfulness of God, the perseverance of Job, and the need that we have to be faithful always, even in the bad times. If you're here tonight and not a child of God, please consider becoming one tonight. Come to the front, confess your faith in Him, put Him on in baptism, be raised to walk in new life. If you're here tonight and you've let things in your life take you away from God, unlike Job, you have cursed God, you've forsaken God, you've gone astray. Make tonight the night that you come back home. Make tonight the night that you say, I'm all yours, God, from here on out. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and as we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling the hope of today,
We'll ask uh, Jim, if he will, to come in just a moment and lead us in a uh, word of prayer on behalf of Angie Barrett. Uh, Angie comes tonight, and she says, I know that I that I'd sent a letter before uh, expressing my desire to repent and change my life, but she said, I, I feel the need tonight to say that I'm yours, God, from here on out. She said, he's, he's pulled me through some tough times in the past, and she said, I've still got some to go in the future. But I want him to know, and I want y'all to know that I'm, I'm his, and I'm all in, and, and I want to I serve him and follow him. We certainly appreciate uh, Angie for that humility and for her desire uh, to say that, uh, to, to say in a public way that uh, she is proclaiming her faith in God. And we want to certainly honor her request uh, to go to him in prayer on her behalf. Jim. Our loving Heavenly Father, we know that you're all powerful. We know that you're all loving. Otherwise, you wouldn't have sacrificed your son. And we're so thankful for your mercy and for your forgiveness. And Father, we are thankful for Angie. We're thankful for her willingness to proclaim her faith in you and her commitment to serve you with her life. We, are, we pray, Father, that what she's done here tonight would be an example to all of us. We when we think of Job and, and all that he went through and, and then him saying that you give and you take away and blessed be your name, we want to have that kind of attitude, Father, that no matter what comes our way, we can always turn to you and put our commitment in you. And we pray your blessings to be with Sister Barrett. We pray that you would bless her life. Bless her walk with you for the rest of her life. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us this, this afternoon. We're glad that everyone was here, especially those that are visiting with us. Uh, we have several announcements before we close tonight. Uh, in the worship bulletin, there's a list of all of those that are sick. In addition to those, uh, we've been asked to remember Bobby Castile. This is the grandfather of Brandy Gann. He's in a local hospital. Also, Brenda Taylor is at home recovering from uh, surgery on her foot, so we need to remember her. Sister Eugenia Kaiser will be having back surgery tomorrow in Tupelo, so we need to remember her. Uh, the other announcement we have is that uh, Angie Bertillon was baptized last Thursday uh, through the jail ministry. That's all of the announcements that we have. If you have not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, you can pass now to the little chapel in the back. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song tonight. <clears throat> After this singing this song, we'll have our closing prayer.
Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunities that we've had today, both this morning and this evening, to be able to come and worship you and not have to worry about persecution or anything like that for coming to do that. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that we've heard from Greg. We just pray that each of us will take what we have heard and be able to apply it to our lives as best as we can and be able to teach others about what all we've learned. Lord, we also pray that you will be with all those who are sick, those who are not able to be here with us for various reasons. We pray for those who have asked for special prayers, especially throughout this week, that you will be with each and every one of them and their families. Lord, we also pray for all those who are overseas and fighting for our country. Lord, we pray that you will keep all them safe and help them be able to return home one day whenever the time is right. Lord, we pray that you will be with all of us as we head back to our homes, and we pray that you will help keep us safe and that, so that we can return back at the next point in time. In Jesus' name, amen.